Um, let me take a look real quick. Sorted by last. Oh, okay. I think I got confused because I, yeah, I saw oh, C twice. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just I totally forgot about that. I had to that. Um, I no, no, that was that was my bad. I was I was kind of going through it too quickly, and then I, I saw this, and it kind of looked like it was empty, but I, I think it was going through it too quickly. So, okay. yeah, that's correct. That's also my mistake. Okay, yeah, no problem. I I, I should have looked at it closer. Yeah, thanks, thanks for catching it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you asked. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, that was that was my fault. Yeah, thanks for asking. It's always always good to ask. Yeah. You too. Yeah. 
Still pretty good though. Yeah. I like Dr. Chung, can you hear me? Um, you shouldn't be muted. Um, pretty sure all the sound is on. You can try talking again. Hello, Dr. Tron. Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, Dr. Tron. Uh, before class starts, can you please check for those of us online if if we are muted or not? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll make sure to do that. It's 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 a bit hard for me to tell because I, I thought I turned all the sound on before uh, before this, so I, I just yeah, uh, I want to make sure I'm able to communicate with you. However, I don't want to keep annoying you. Uh, um, so should I just write a uh, a message in in a chat to, like? Reminder to check if we're muted. Yeah, I mean, just uh, just doing a mic check before the uh, before the class, I think is, is okay. I'll I'll try to uh, I'll try to be more cognizant next yeah, time. So. Um, I, yeah, because I, I I don't want the volume because in the past the volume has been really high and so it kind of comes out really high. So I I'm see. trying to be a little bit sensitive for that too. So I see. Uh, I see. I'll just try. I'll make sure I know. So it's that forty five. So yeah, I'm just trying um not to annoy anyone in our class just hearing my voice. Uh, pop up every now and then uh so yeah 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 i mean just just doing it we can do a mic check uh before every every class i think that's okay uh yeah you can try talking if you don't hear me just you know just say something in chat you know it's it's not annoying at all it sounds it sounds good 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to make sure it's all set up. But if it's not set up, then you know we can we can fix it each time. Because because you, you know different faculty come in and they, and they yeah I them, understand you know? sir I understand. And so you know they might have they might also change some things too. So yeah. you know, um, just getting it all checked out before each lecture is is, is fine. Thank you, sir. All right, it's uh, seven o'clock, so let's go and get started. All right, good, uh, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Doing good, doing good. All right, so today is our second ANSYS activity. And so, um, you know, first activity, I know it was kind of a little bit hectic. So today I think will be a little bit more smooth sailing. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna hold your hand as much from this one. Um, you, know, a lot of, you know, a lot of this process that we're gonna do today is, is very similar to what we did in the first one. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to let you guys kind of explore the software and kind of experiment it with, experiment with it a bit more today than I did on activity one. Okay. All right. Uh, and I think the exciting thing about activity two is that this is activity two is kind of more and more consistent with kind of how you would use ants um, kind of in a practical setting. Okay. And so if you remember in activity one, we spent a good amount of time constructing the geometry ourselves. Um, and so that's, you know, that skill is also useful to have. Um, you know, even because sometimes, you know, you might get a geometry, you might have to modify it for your FBA, but typically the way that you use ANSYS is that you, you get a CAD model from someone, you load it into ANSYS, and then you just kind of start your analysis from, from there, okay? And so today we'll kind of mimic that. Uh, that work. Okay. So here is the, uh, the situation. And so uh, the, the title for activity two is called bike crank analysis. And so the subject is going to be, you know, this, this crank on a bike. And so you know, for, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who have ridden a bike before, you know, the crank is, is part of the, a big part of the assembly, okay? And we want to analyze it because, you know, um, we're kind of taking the role here uh, as a kind of a bike uh, designer or bike manufacturer. And we want to see that, you know, if this bike crank that we're designing here, is it strong enough to withstand the, the amount of forces that we, that it, it'll typically experience? Uh, or will it fail under these, under these loads? And so we're gonna use FEA to kind of determine that you know, determine, um, you know, how strong this bike crank is. Okay. All right, and so we're gonna do, we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna learn a few new skills today. And so in particular, we're gonna learn how to import a custom geometry. So we're gonna be importing geometry in ANSYS. We'll be creating a custom material property. Okay. And of course, you know, the big difference between this and the last one is that we're gonna be doing this analysis in 3D. Okay, so it's gonna be our first 3D analysis in all right, and so if you want to look at the, the PDF, um, and just like last time, you know, I'll be, I'll be kind of going through the PDF at a certain pace, but if you want to move ahead during the class, that's fine as well. Uh, I know I posted this yesterday as, as well, and so you, if you've already kind of gotten started on the, uh, on the assignment, that's, that's okay too. But the Thank main you, thing Dr. you're going to today are going to be the project PDF, uh, which you can download from the Canvas site. So you go to assignments, and you'll see there's activity two. And so you can download the PDF uh, here, okay? Um, and you're also going to need the, the CAD files for this as well. 
Okay, so for, for, for just the class today, the only CAD file you need is just the first one, which is crank assembly. Okay, so you can go ahead and download that. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, the other one's for the homework assignment. Yeah. Um, and so if you finish early today, you can get started on the on the second CAD file, but the only one you're gonna need for just the in-class act part is just the crank assembly. Okay. All right, and so just like last time, we're gonna open up Workbench. And so you're gonna go to your start screen, go to ANSYS 2021 or 2023 or whatever version you have and click on Workbench, okay? And then after you do that, you're gonna um, open up to this uh, to this screen right here. Okay. All right, so I'll give, I'll give people just a minute or two, just if you're still downloading or if you're still opening up ANSYS, um, but you know, in probably in about a minute or so, I'm gonna start kind of, um, Yeah. Uh, it does. It does to an extent because they change the file format each year. So each version of ANSYS kind of has its own unique um, file format. So 2021, 2022, 2023. Um, you can upscale. And so what you can do is you can take a file that's in 2021 format and you can upscale it to like 2022 or 2023. The unfortunate thing is you can't go backwards. And so if you save a if you save a project on your home computer, um, I think the student version that's available online is 2023. And so you won't be able to start a project at home and then open it on these lab computers because these lab computers are still 2021. Yeah, so just kind of be aware. Of that. And so, you know, the way the way the best way to kind of work on these projects is to kind of start them, start them in the class and then kind of finish them up at home. Um, either that or just try to finish all of it in the class. So it's all kind of in the same version. Yeah, good question. Um. I would recommend to just find out what the version is used on campus and download that version at home. So you have the same versions because all the prior yeah. versions are, are available online also. Yeah, if you if you can find if you can find the uh, the 2021 version online, then um, for the student version, then you can you can do that as well. Then then you don't have to worry about any version. Yeah, that's a good that's a good suggestion. Okay, all right, so does everyone have ANSYS Workbench open and have all the CAD files or just, just the one CAD file downloaded? Everyone's good to go. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. And so just like last time, we're going to run a static structural simulation. And so we're gonna take static structural and we're gonna click and drag it to the main kind of um, you know workstation here, okay? And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import our geometry. Okay? So if you remember last time, we, we basically created our geometry from scratch. Uh, but the nice thing about this now is that we can just import this. And so you're going to right click on geometry, you're going to go to import geometry, and then you're going to click on browse. Okay. And then after you click on browse, you're going to get, go to the section where you downloaded the geometry and double click on the file called crank assembly. Okay. And so the crank assembly should already be in a file format that's recognized by ANSYS. And so it should load kind of right away. But if you did want to, if you did want to verify the geometry, you can go ahead and view the geometry in Design Modeler. <coughs> and you should be able to see the geometry there. Um, Dr. Chan, uh, yes. for the homework assignments, when we're um, provided the CAD files, are are the dimensions of the CAD files provided on the homework assignments, or we're just we need to use the exact CAD files. Uh, you you should use the the CAD okay. files that are given. Um, okay. They don't um, they don't have they don't have the dimensions um, in them because they were generated in another program. Uh, but you can see the approximate size of the of the of each part using kind of this ruler here. On so the so so I'm thinking I'm thinking. Uh, you mentioned we could upgrade our 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 uh, our models, but not downgrade. Uh, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, so does that mean that the CAD files uh, are any do CAD files open on any version of ANSYS? Yeah, the, oh, yeah, the okay. CAD files open on any version. So okay, the CAD perfect. files are not version specific. Perfect. Um, Thank you. So what is version specific are the project files of ANSYS itself. The actual simulations and the results. The actual simulations, correct. Yes. I see. Thank you, sir. The question? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, right click on geometry and then import. And then you go to browse. Uh, well, I don't have it here because I, and then you go and then you double click on the crank assembly.x underscore t. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All 
All right, and so if you want to view the CAD file, you can go open up in Design Model or click Generate. This is this is optional, and so you know if you if you import it, typically when you import it, it should have this green check mark next to it. And so if you after you import a geometry and it has the green check mark, that 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 usually means that the CAD file is okay. Uh, but if you did want to view it and check it, you can view it in Design Model. Or you may have to click Generate, you know, if the if the CAD file is not showing up automatically. Um, but you can view the CAD uh, CAD file here. And one thing you'll notice about this CAD file too is that it, it is actually an assembly. So there are multiple parts involved in this, in this CAD file. But for this particular um, activity, we're just going to work on just one part of this, uh, of this CAD file. Okay. Well, we're, we'll the, uh, the, the subject for activity three is going to be the uh, assemblies. But for now, you know, we're just we're doing our first 3D simulation. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and close Design Modeler. Okay. You remember, you don't have to open up Design Modeler. That's, that's only if you wanted to inspect the geometry. Um, this CAD file should open up and should uh, import without any issues because you know I've done this same activity for years now. <laughs> okay. All right, so before we open up ANSYS Mechanical, the, the first thing we're actually gonna do is we're going to create a custom material property. Okay? And so if you remember from activity one, this is one thing that we kind of glossed over. So we kind of just used the default material that was in ANSYS already. Uh, but this time we are gonna make our own because if you look at the, prop, the project specifications, mm -hmm. This bike crank is made of aluminum, okay? And so we want to make sure that the, um, that the simulation recognizes the fact that we're using aluminum and that it has the proper material properties. So it has the correct Young's modulus and has the correct Poisson's ratio. All right, so to, to create a custom material property, you're going to go, you're going to, go to uh, Workbench and you're going to double click on this button here called Engineering Data, okay? And so when you double click on this, it's, the, the screen is going to change fast. And so I'm, I'm not going to double click it just yet, but you should see kind of a new screen open up um, for uh, where you can enter new material properties. Okay. So I'm going, to, I'm going to double click on engineering data here. Okay. And, you, if, and then after you double click engineering data, you should come up to this screen right here. And if you're confused about kind of where you are in the workbench, basically we've opened up a new tab here on this, uh, on this section. Okay. And so if you want to go back to the workbench, you can either just click on project here, so that'll take you back, or you can close this tab. But you know, we're gonna be working on here, so you know you might as well just keep the tab open. Okay. And so to add a new material, you can see right now we only have one material available to us, which is structural steel. Okay. And so uh, the first the, the material that we're gonna add, we'll call it aluminum. In particular, it's aluminum 6061 T6. Okay. Uh, although in theory, you can, you can name the material whatever you want, but generally speaking, you should name your materials um, kind of the same as what they actually are, so you don't get confused. All right, so after you give your material name, um, you can go ahead, go ahead and hit enter. Okay. And you should see that you've created your new material, but there is kind of a blue question mark here. And so that blue question mark is ANSYS way of telling you that you're not done yet. And so you, you haven't specified everything you need to for this material, okay? Uh, because all we've done is given it a name. And so we need to specify the Young's modulus and the, um, and the Poisson's ratio, okay? All right, so to do that, you know, we need to tell ANSYS what kind of material this is, okay? And so the next place we're gonna look is kind of this left side of the screen here, where it has all these different materials that you can uh, apply in ANSYS, okay? And so there's a lot available here. Um, and so you can create you know, a very, very custom material with very kind of unique properties okay? with things like um, hyperelasticity, plasticity, um, viscoelasticity, you know, a lot of different things. But for this uh, activity, we're gonna keep it simple. And so we're gonna go to linear elastic, okay? And so we're gonna expand the, uh, expand the menu for linear elastic, okay? And then we're gonna double click on isotropic elasticity. So isotropic elasticity is the type of material that we're going to use for, for this one. So let's go ahead and double click that. Okay. And so make, sh make sure that you have aluminum 6061 T6 highlighted and then double click on isotropic elasticity. Okay. And then the next place you're going to look is kind of down here in the middle of the screen. Okay. So let me go ahead and clear this. Question. Uh, uh, Question, so is, there, question. is there a way, oh, go ahead. Yes, Ivan. Oh, um, I was just making you aware of, a, of the question in chat. Oh yeah, yeah, I can, I, can, I can see the notification for the chat. Thank you, Don. Yep. 
Okay. Um, so the question is, is there a way to make a library of materials? And so um, if you want to use a built-in library, there is this tab right here called the engineering data sources. Uh, but in terms of kind of saving your own materials, um, <laughs> I don't know if that's a feature in the, uh, um, in, the in kind of the academic version of ANSYS, uh, but I think, I think there is a way to kind of save it for, uh, for that. Yeah. Once you have the Illuminum highlighted, what do you click? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me kind of go back here. Yeah. So when you when you do, when you have the Illuminum sixty sixty one T six highlighted, you're going to go to the left hand side of the screen. You're going to click on linear elasticity, and then you're going to double click on isotropic elasticity. Yeah. Yeah. So we're basically specifying that this is an isotropic elastic material. And then the option. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the bottom of the screen. We're going to click on this plus arrow next to isotropic elasticity. Okay. And then you're going to specify the Young's modulus in yellow right here, and you're going to specify the Poisson's ratio. Yeah. Question? Yes. Uh, what's the difference between the properties of the outline? Um, oh, this one, these ones on the on the right right here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is so the table on the right, this is this is used if you want to specify. The fact that your material is going to change properties with temperature, and so if you specify the the properties on the bottom, that's kind of its constant value, and so it's always going to have that value. But if you if you're doing kind of a, a multi physics simulation where you're heating up the material or maybe cooling the material, you know you want to simulate the fact that your material is going to get softer. Most materials get softer as they heat up, and so you could specify that. Also. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't specify anything on this table here, it's going to use. You can consider the ones down here as kind of the default values, and the ones over here as if you're if you're running a multi physics simulation, then it would use this table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go ahead and specify the Young's modulus. And so uh, the Young's modulus from the PDF, you can see here is one times ten to the seventh psi. You have to be careful here because you want to make sure that the units that you're choosing for the Young's modulus is correct. And so the default units that it actually gives you is Pascal. And so before you enter the Young's modulus here, you want to make sure you change this to PSI. Okay. Okay, so let's change this to PSI. And then let's enter the Young's modulus. So the Young's modulus is 1 E7. Okay. And then the Poisson's ratio for this uh, material. To go back to the PDF is 0 0.33. Okay. 0 .33. All right. And so the other things that it will compute, and so if you'll notice that it, this uh, this material property also has the bulk modulus and the shear modulus, um, and so you can see those are computed automatically based on your values for the Young's modulus. Okay. And so the only ones you have to specify is just the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. And again, you know the most important thing is to make sure that you have the right units for the Young's modulus, that it's in PSI, not Pascal. Okay, um, okay. any questions on, on this so far? Everyone was able to make their own custom material? Okay. Everyone on Zoom doing okay? Good. Yeah, um, I'm doing good. I'll speak up if I get stuck or, I, or if I have any questions, but I can only speak for myself. Okay. No, that's that's perfect. Yeah, if you, if you, if people on Zoom, if you guys are having issues, just yeah, don't be afraid to speak up. Or you know, if you can't speak, then drop it, drop a note in the chat, then you know, I'll, I'll come see. It. it sounds good, sir. Yep. Okay. All right. So now we're done. We're done here. So let's go ahead and close this this tab. Okay. So remember the uh, the materials properties tab is uh, it's right here. So let's go ahead and close this this tab, and that should bring us back to the workbench. It automatically saves. It automatically saves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to double click on model right here. And this is going to open up ANSYS Mechanical. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this part takes a bit of time, so don't uh, don't panic. You know, remember the if you're if you if you're in workbench and you double click on model in the bottom left of the screen, you should see you know what ANSYS is up to. So right now it's starting mechanical. And this always takes a while, so you know, make sure you give it uh, a few minutes. Not a few minutes, just uh, you know, thirty seconds or something. Okay. All right. And so, if you did everything correctly, so if you imported the geometry, 
Um, you should be able to see the geometry here. And so you can see that it's automatically kind of attached to our project, okay? And you should see three parts of this assembly. So you should see the bike crank itself. You should see kind of a cylinder coming out. So this is the pedal. And we have kind of this, this almost like a nut that, that's kind of attaching the pedal to the bike crank. Okay. And so the first thing we're gonna do, and, and if, you're, if you're getting that, that weird ad that comes up to ask you to share your social security number or whatever with ANSYS, um, you can just click on geometry right here and it'll, it'll bring up, it should bring up your geometry. Okay. okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to suppress some parts of this assembly, okay? And so a lot of times when you're running ANSYS, uh, you're gonna be working with assemblies, assemblies of different parts from CAD, uh, but oftentimes you don't, you don't want every single part in the assembly. So a useful skill to learn is to learn how to suppress different parts of this assembly, okay? All right, and so if you click on this plus arrow next to geometry right here, you should see that there are three parts that we can, uh, that we can, um, that we can see. And if you click on each part, it should highlight in the geometry here. Okay. And so if you look at this first part right here, this bike crank 2 rev 2011 X 0.375, this is the main bike crank. So this is the one that we wanna run our simulation on. We have the pedal. And so the pedal is kind of just this rod that's kind of sticking out. And then this part nine carat assem 2 rev X 0.375, this weird kind of you know, nut thing that attaches the pedal. All right, and so in this simulation, we only really care about this, uh, this bike crank. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna suppress the other parts so that we don't have to deal with them. Okay. So to suppress a part, we're gonna right click on the part, and then you're gonna click on the option here for suppress body, okay? And then after you do that, then that part should go away from the geometry. Okay. And then we're gonna do the same thing for this part nine, the SEM, whatever. So suppressing is different from hiding. And so, you know, you may, you may be tempted to just hide the part. Okay. Bless you. Um, but hiding actually doesn't remove it from the simulation. So hiding it will just remove its visibility. Okay. We actually want to take it out from the simulation completely. So we're going to make sure you make sure you click suppress. So don't, don't just hide the body, just suppress the body. Okay. And so after you suppress those two parts, you should be left with just the bike crank uh, itself right here. Okay. And then the last thing we're gonna do before we move on is we're gonna make sure that this bike crank has the proper material properties. Okay. And so with bike crank two rev, uh, with that highlighted, you're gonna to go to the bottom left of the screen. And then in the bottom left of the screen, you should see a setting here for the material. Okay. And right now the setting for the material is structural steel. And so we're gonna change that to aluminum. And so if you click on the little arrow next to structural seal, you should open up, it should open up a menu here for all of the available materials. Um, and it should have stainless uh, structural seal there, but it should also have the custom aluminum 6061 material that we just created uh, in Workbench. Okay? And so you wanna make sure you click on that aluminum 6061 um, to assign that material to the bike. Okay. okay. Um, any questions on, on this so far? All right, everyone was able to open up mechanical and get the bike crank and suppress the parts. All right, question, yes. Yeah, so if the details doesn't show up, um, you may have to kind of reset the, uh, the window. And so uh, the way that I usually do it is I go to home and I go to layout here. Um, and then you and then you know one way you can try resetting it. And so if you click on reset, it should hopefully bring the details menu back. Um, but if it's still not there, then I think you can go to also go to layout, manage, and then details like here too. So I think the I think the looks like the hotkey for it is control D. Um, but if you're ever missing any kind of windows here that you're seeing, a good way to find it again is to go to layout and just reset the layout. It should should bring everything up. Okay. Um, Dr. Tron. Yes. Um, is there, uh, someone just posted a question in chat, but I yep. was going to, um, I was going to ask, uh, instead of suppressing, um, would it be okay to just delete the whole part or, or, or? uh, so it's used, usually, usually I like to suppress it. Cause you know, you know, you never know, you may want to use the part later yeah, for the whole assembly part analysis. And so if after suppressing it, you can bring it back. And so you can unsuppress the part yeah, and it comes uh, back. It's um, just a thought I had. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you absolutely are not going to need it, then you can you can definitely delete it. 
Um, but I would I would just go with suppressing because that's, that that's kind good. of good. Sounds good. All right, questions. So from the chat. So does the imported part have its material properties imported too? Meaning if we made our own part, we wouldn't need to change it to aluminum enhances. Yeah. So actually, if, if you did import the part from SolidWorks, I think if you use certain file formats, it should it should um, retain its material properties. Um, I don't think X underscore T is is a is a file format that that respects those material properties. Um, but I think if you use a file, for, <coughs> excuse me, if you use like an IGS file format uh, or an STP, I think I think it should say the material properties um, you know in in there. It should, it should come along with the part, but you have you have to use the right file form. Yeah. Question. So the materials have like a uh -huh. um, say it again. So back back here or uh -huh. oh oh yeah. So uh so that you don't have to worry about it right now. We'll 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 learn what that does, I think, in activity six or seven. Uh, but that's that's if you want to do optimization, basically. Yeah, so for now, it doesn't matter if you check it or not. Um, I would just leave it unchecked just, just to be sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and move on. And so the next step after, uh, after our geometry is all squared away is the mesh, okay? And so let's go ahead and just create a default mesh just to see what ANSYS gives us. And so let's generate the mesh. Okay. So you can right click on mesh here, you can click on generate and it'll create kind of a default mesh, okay? And so remember, we talked about meshing on Monday. So meshing is basically the process of taking your geometry and turning it into simplified shapes, okay? And so it looks like for the default mesh, in this case, ANSYS chose a tetrahedral mesh. Okay? Remember, we talked about tetrahedrons are kind of the triangular 3D element, okay? And so you can kind of see that visually here. And so th this default mesh, um, you know, for me, I would say this is not very good because it's very coarse, okay? And so let's let's go ahead and uh, start improving this this mesh here. All right, so let's create two objects here. So let's right click on mesh. Let's go ahead and click on method. Okay. So if you recall from Monday, the method object will let you change the shape of the elements that are in the in the mesh. It'll also let you change the element order. Okay. Let's go ahead and click on that. And then uh, let's assign this to the entire geometry. So let's click on this entire geometry here and click apply. And then let's also add a sizing object. So let's go ahead and right click on mesh, click on insert, and let's click on sizing. Okay. Remember the sizing object, what this is gonna do is that it's gonna allow us to change the size of the elements in the mesh. Okay. So let's go ahead and click on that. And then for the element size, uh, let's go ahead and make this smaller. So let's create, make this five millimeters. Okay. And then for the method object, let's change the method to, let's try to make a hex mesh. Okay, so let's change the method to hex dominant. And then for the element order, let's change it to quadratic. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and generate the mesh. <clears throat> okay. And so you can see by changing those settings, we get a much, much more uh, higher quality mesh. Okay, so we have a hexahedral mesh, which is, which is good. Okay. Remember we talked about on, on Monday that if you can make a hexahedral mesh, that's generally preferable because hexahedrons have um, much better properties. Um, and we have much better sizing. Okay? So we have much better size. All right, one, one good metric that you can use, and, and we'll talk about this more later on in the class. Uh, one good kind of very quick way to tell if your mesh is decent or not, is to kind of look at kind of the, uh, the thickness of your, of, your, of your geometry, okay? And so if you look at our, at our bike crank right here, we can see that it's very kind of thin in the Z direction. Okay? So if we kind of look in this direction right here, this is kind of its thinnest direction. Okay? And so usually what you like to see is that across the, across the thinnest dimension in your geometry, you should have at least two layers of elements. Okay? Um, and so if you go back, so let me go ahead back and change the size. Okay? So you can see kind of from this mesh right here, we have two layers of elements, right? across the thickness, but if we change the size, let's go ahead and change this back to, I think the default was 11. This may not work because we did hexes, but we'll see. Oh, it worked, okay. All right, and so if you can see, once I increase the, the mesh size, now through the thickness, I only have one layer of elements, okay? That's generally not a good idea. So generally speaking, whenever you have a thin, um, a thin geometry like this, 
you want to have at least two layers of elements in there. Okay, so you want to make sure the size is small enough so that you have two layers of elements. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and look at the statistics here. <clears throat> And so the number of elements that we have is 1300 about. So that's very, that's still very modest. That's not a high number of elements at all, okay? All right, so the next thing I'm gonna look at is the quality, okay? So remember on Monday, we talked about mesh quality. And so remember, we wanna make sure that not only do we have our mesh elements that are small enough, um, but they should be good quality as well. And, and I can kind of already tell, just kind of based on looking at this mesh, we should get pretty good quality here. Because if you look at these elements, you know, they're not really distorted at all. They're kind of a very nice kind of block blockular shape, okay? But let's, uh, let's go ahead and check. Okay. okay, and so to check the mesh quality, you're going to click left click on mesh right here. And then in the details window in the bottom left, you're gonna click on the plus arrow next to quality, okay? All right, and so after you click on quality, you should see that there is a setting here for mesh metric. And right now it's set to none. And so right now it's not showing us any uh, mesh quality metrics. And so what we wanna do, oops, is we wanna change this to skewness. Okay. So there's, there's actually quite a few different uh, metrics for mesh quality, but the, I think the easiest one to kind of see is skewness right here. Okay. okay. All right, and so let's, let's look at the skewness here and let's look at the metrics. Okay. All right, so the minimum skewness that we have here is just basically zero. And so this is something, a really small number. The max skewness that we have here is 0 0.99977. And the average skewness is about, um, you know, 0 0.5. Okay. And then if you want to see kind of the histogram of the elements, you can kind of see them. You kind of see them here. Okay. Professor, I have okay. a question. Yeah. How did you get hex dominant method for the mesh? Yeah, good question. So the hex dominant method is uh, it's done from the, the method object. So it was from the, the method here. And so this is the same setting box that we use to uh, specify a quadratic order. And so the method, uh, to get hex dominant, you would click on this one right here. Okay, I see. Yeah. So I, I will say that the hex dominant mesh may not work for everyone. It's, it's kind of a finicky thing. And so it may, you, you tr if you try to make a hex dominant mesh, ANSYS may give you an error that said that it's, it's not possible. Um, that's, that's kind of something random that happens between computers. And, you know, I still haven't really quite figured out kind of what's, what's happening there. And so if you're getting an error with the hex dominant mesh, you may have to change it to tetrahedron. Um, and that's okay. So tetrahedron is perfectly fine for this assignment. Um, and actually it's perfectly fine for a lot of things too. So it's perfectly okay. Okay. All right. So mesh quality. And so, um, and so if we click on this, you can see kind of the elements here that are kind of uh, low quality here, right? And so this is kind of nice because it actually kind of highlights to you where kind of the low quality elements are. And you can see most of them are kind of near the edges here. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so you're looking under mesh quality. So you're clicking on quality here and you're clicking on skewness. And then what, what should happen is that in the kind of the bottom middle, you should see kind of a histogram of the different mesh qualities. And so if you click on kind of the bars here, they show you which elements are of that of that quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so remember the lowest quality elements are gonna be the ones with the skewness close to one. And so you can see um, for this particular mesh that I have, the low quality elements are all tetrahedrons, okay? And so they've kind of belonged to this, uh, um, to this, ele this element class right here. Okay, so you can see that the histogram bar is red and red refers to tech 10, which is a tetrahedral element. Okay. And so if you click on this, you can see all of the low quality elements that are close to one. Okay, and so if you kind of see them, you kind of look at these kind of elements individually right here, you can see that they're quite distorted. So they're not kind of a nice kind of shape. They're kind of either really, really flat or really kind of stretched out. Okay. So these elements are pretty low quality. I would say in this case, there's not that many of them. Um, and so they shouldn't have that adverse of an effect on the solution. Um, but if you wanted to get rid of them, you could reduce the size right here. So instead of five, we can reduce this to maybe three. Okay. <coughs> so let's go ahead and generate the mesh again. You should see the quality update. Okay. okay. And so you can see it, it may look like the maximum uh, skewness here has gotten worse. 
But if you look at the share of elements that are max skewness, it's, it's actually less right now, okay? And so this bar here is much, much lower. Um, so I changed, I just changed the size of the elements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, and so someone after the lecture last time pointed out the fact that in, if you look in the notes, I talked about, you know, if a good skewness metric to reach it was much lower than the, uh, than the averages that I had in the class. Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, because we're using kind of a, a trial version or a student version of ANSYS, it is really hard to get the mesh quality to a really good spot for most of the elements. But if you can get to a point where most of the elements are kind of in this range of like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 quality uh, on average, then that's usually a good, pretty good point, pretty good point to be. But sometimes, you know, a, a, de a small amount of, uh, of highly skewed elements is just kind of unavoidable, just kind of based on, you know, the geometry. Okay, so don't, so don't panic if you get a max skewness of like 0 0.99, something like this. It's usually just a couple elements in the mesh and it's, it's usually just, just fine. What you're kind of more concerned about is kind of the average skewness, and you want to make sure this is less than like 0 0.5 or something like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions on the mesh and the mesh quality? Question in the chat. Let's see. All right. Question Is it normal to get this mesh over everything I drew in mesh? This mesh contains internal pyramid elements. Yeah. No, that's, that's totally normal. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to get a mesh that's 100% hexahedrons, okay? Um, and so what's gonna, what's gonna end up happening most of the time is that you're gonna have elements, some elements that are gonna be tetrahedrons or pyramids. Um, and so that message there is just kind of telling you the percentage of elements that are, um, that are pyramids. And that's, and that's totally okay. Yeah, don't worry about that. Question, there's a question out here too? Yeah. What if you get a pyramid? So it's not able to make a hex dominant mesh. And you might have to change it to tetrahedrons, and so that that happens for kind of a small percentage of, of computers. It's kind of somewhat random. I think it's I honestly think it's something based on just the memory allocation within each computer, um, and so you're just gonna have to switch it to tetrahedrons. But that's but that's okay. And so to go to and so to change it, you're gonna go to hex dominant mesh or method right here, and change this to tetrahedrons, and that sh that should clear the air. Yeah. Question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so to get this view right here, you're gonna to go to quality. You're gonna change the quality metric to skewness, and then you're gonna click on the different bars in the histogram. So that basically tells you which elements in the mesh have that certain quality. Yeah. So it's nice for kind of debugging. So you know you can see here that most of the poor quality elements are kind of are kind of centered around the ends. And so you could use that information to say that, you know, maybe I should refine the mesh in those areas to make the mesh quality really better. You know, so. Yeah, you have to click. So if you you have to make sure that the bottom window is up, and you have to click on the different bars in the histogram. Yeah, and so the ones you're mostly concerned about are the ones on the right side of the histogram because those are the poor quality elements with the high amount of skews. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, under the mesh, the left uh, the left mesh side for the top the element size. Yeah. This is default. I accidentally changed the size from there. That's fine. And then the body side thing that goes down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fine. So so when that happens, uh, basically it's it's gonna take the body sizing. So this is gonna overwrite. So these, so if you change the mesh sizing here from just the mesh, mm -hmm. that's kind of like the global settings, but then you can overwrite that with the body size option. Yeah. So right now it's not really relevant because we just have one part. But starting activity three, you'll we're gonna have multiple parts that we're working with. So sometimes you want to mesh a certain area with a certain size. And so that's when you have kind of different settings for different parts. Yeah. Right, let me turn this off just so we can see the mesh. All right, any questions, any other questions on the, on the mesh? Okay. okay, all right, so that's the mesh. <coughs> Uh, you know, feel free to play around with the two. So, you know, you don't have to use the same settings as me, um, but definitely experiment with that. Okay. All right, next is the loads and constraints. Okay. And so this is, this is where I'm gonna kind of uh, let you kind of work on work. This is where you're gonna kind of spend most of your time today, okay? And so the next thing we're gonna specify here are, is the, basically the boundary conditions for the simulation, okay? All right, so I'll, I will tell you that there are two main boundary conditions that we need to specify. And so we need to specify a fixed support, okay? And we're gonna need to specify a force load. So you're gonna click insert, you're gonna click on force, okay? 
right? So these are the two boundary conditions that you that you're going to specify. Um, but you know, um, I'll leave it up to you guys to determine kind of where these are applied and kind of what values that they're going to have. Okay? Uh, remember, you know, this is a bike crank, and if you kind of look, it's a little bit hard to see kind of just looking at the at the bike crank. But remember, this side right here, this right, this side right here attaches to the bike. And this side right here is the pedal. Okay. Right. And so what we're simulating in this in this ANSYS simulation is kind of like a worst case scenario. So let's imagine the fact that you know you're kind of riding your bike and the bike uh, kind of gets kind of hits a snag. And so the whole bike kind of locks up because the wheels can't turn. Okay. And so in that particular case, you know, someone is pushing down on the bike on the pedal. And so we have a force that's being applied on the pedal side. Uh, but the bike crank itself is locked in place, okay? And so we want to simulate that, um, that effect here using the boundary conditions. And so I will tell you that the force that's being applied has a magnitude of 100 pounds. Okay. And so we'll assume that the person pushing down on this bike is um, with a magnitude of 100 pounds. Okay. And so I'll leave it up to you guys to determine, you need to determine a few things. And so you need to determine where you want to apply the fixed support. Okay. Um, next, you need to determine the location of where to apply the force. And the third thing you need to uh, do is you need to choose the direction for the force. Okay. So remember the force is a vector. So you need, to make, you need to choose whether you're gonna apply the force this way, you're gonna apply the force this way, or maybe this way, okay? Well, I kind of spoiled it. <laughs> so that's basically where you're gonna apply the force. Um, but I want you to choose the direction that kind of makes the most, uh, makes the most sense, okay? And remember, you know, we're looking at a worst case scenario. So you want to choose the direction here that's going to result in the most amount of stress in the in the ball. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so I'll leave you guys to it. And if you have questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, at this point, you know, if you're, if you're kind of struggling with the mesh or the other parts, I'll go kind of go around and help catch people up. Um, but go ahead and start working on this, okay? And then when you're done, when you think you're done applying the boundary conditions, um, you can go ahead and run the simulation. So remember, um, the main things we're going to need is you're going to need to check the total deformation, and you're going to need to check the equivalent von Mises stress. Okay. And so once you've applied the boundary conditions in the right locations and the right directions, go ahead and run the simulation, and you should be able to see the, uh, uh, the results. Okay. All right. If you have questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'll come around to you, and then uh, I'll come back and check the Zoom call. That's that's one of the that's one of the downsides of refinement is that the refinement algorithm does turn it into that type of things. And so that's that is something that you'll have to use. I will say in this case, you probably don't need to use the fine piece. Um, and you'll it'll make more sense after you run the simulation. It's usually you want to add refinement in the place where the stress is the highest. Um, and once you run the simulation, you'll see the location where the stress is highest. And it's kind of hard to apply refinement in that area. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about refinement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in that case, you should be able to like Yes. So the way the way that I would do that is that if you go to um, this is a little bit advanced, but if you go to the sizing of it, just go ahead and click on it. Yeah. And so instead of geometry methods, you click on that. And so you can do name selection. And so you can kind of uh, select it. But there's also another way to so go back to geometry. So, go to geometry. There's a way that you can specify a sphere. So you kind of move a sphere kind of in that area, and then you can basically just refine the mesh in that sphere. Um, I thought it was from from here. Maybe another way. Yeah, but that's that's kind of how. Yeah, so the so first thing you would do is you would choose the location of where the force is in the sort of force, and then um, instead of defined by, you're going to change that to components. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So you can you can change the direction. So instead of um, C on the left, called defined by. Okay, so instead of vector, you can change that to. So you can specify uh, text. Uh, yeah. Maybe I should. I should have. Yeah. So Zoom people. Uh, so I got a lot of questions on how to specify the direction of the force. And so if you go to the force here, instead of defining it by a vector, you can define it by components. <laughs> And so if you do that, then you can specify the individual X, Y, Z components of the force. Yeah. And then if you, if you want to specify in pounds, you can change the units here to pound force, just like that. Okay, so just like, just like before. Um, 
bending, bending is always a good thing. Yeah, that's where the fix. So remember, you can think about it. So it's 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 what your mark is that we should be used for attaching. So this is attached to point. So the whole break itself. So many functions. How's everyone on Zoom doing? Doing good? Yeah, I'm doing good. Good, good. Um, Dr. Chan. Yep. Did you get this uh, CAD model from a certain popular bike? Like, where did the CAD model come from? You just got it uh, online, or, or did yeah, you make I, I it? Yeah, I found, I found, I found it online. Bike? I'll go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering if this came from an actual model of an actual bike, or no, no information so, regarding so the I, CAD. Yeah, yeah. So I, I get this comment every year from people who actually ride bikes that said this bike crank actually sucks ass. And so, you know, I, I <laughs> so this, this is, this is from an ANSYS tutorial. Um, uh, I see. I, I basically, I modified it for this class. I see. I see. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So the, so the force, remember, force should be applied at the pedal. That's where per, the person's pedaling down. And so I chose just this, just this in kind of inner rate that gives the force. And then for the fixed support, I chose all three of these bases right here. So, you just chose like so I, chose, I chose the surface. Yeah. Yeah. So this, so this is one thing we'll actually talk about on Monday. So on Monday, we're going to have a lecture on, on boundary conditions. Generally speaking, if you have the choice to either choose a face or a or an edge, because you can you can choose an edge too. Um, generally speaking, you want to apply things on faces because that, that's a lot more stable than edges. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> 
Okay, all right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and bring it back in. Just to uh, you know, there's there's a few more parts. We're 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 pretty much done with the activity here, but there's there's a couple more parts I want to talk about uh, with regards to you know what you have to do for homework. Okay. All right, and so you know if you uh, um, you know if you're if you're kind of kind of watching what I was doing, you know, the, so the two boundary conditions that I apply is I apply the fixed support here on the left hand side, and so you can see here uh, we have these three kind of bolt holes. And so these are the parts where they attach the bike. Okay? And so if we think about the situation that we're simulating here where the bike kind of locks up, right? This part right here is gonna lock up because the, the wheels aren't able to turn. And so this is a great place to, uh, to apply the fixed support. And then the force, I'm applying it on the other side, which is where the pedal is. And that's where you know, a human would actually be pushing down onto the pedal. Okay? And if you look at the direction, I chose the direction to be in the Y direction. You can either choose the minus Y or the positive Y. Um, because this is kind of the worst case scenario because, you know, this puts the, you know, if you, if you consider this bike crank as just kind of a slender rod or a slender kind of truss element, um, it puts this into a bending mode. And so what we know is that bending causes the most amount of stress. And so that's kind of why I chose that direction. Okay. All right. Um, so any quick questions? Yeah, questions? Yeah, good question. So to change the units, you want to click on home here. Um, in the ANSYS mechanical, and then in the middle of the screen, you have a click. You can uh, click on units, and then for this one, I, I choose the 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 last one here, which is U.S. customary with inches and pound force. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's a, there's a few things, uh, a couple of things I want to talk about for the homework, and then I'll kind of let you guys work on it until the end of class. Okay. And so if you ran the simulation with the with the bike crank and bending, you should see that the equivalent force, the maximum <coughs> equivalent force should be around 13,332, okay, PSI. Okay. If you look at problem five on the homework, uh, is, it, is it significantly different or is it kind of different? Uh, is, it, is the units in PSI? Yeah. So there, there's two options for, for pounds. And so there's the first one, which is pound force. Um, so this is PSF, so that's pounds per square foot. And if you choose the second one, it should be pounds per square inch PSL. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so basically everything that we've done up to this point, we've done up to problem four together, okay? Problem five on the homework is, is I want you to find the maximum amount of load that the, um, that the bike crank can handle, okay? So that's so that's what we're going to determine for these results. Yeah. So there there is a way that you can you can set answers to basically give you a factor of safety. Um, and so if the, if the factor of safety is less than one, then the bike crank can break. But we're going to do it a little bit more manually for, for this first activity. Yeah. And so for um, for the material that we chose, this aluminum sixty sixty one, we know that it has a yield strength of thirty five thousand psi. Okay. And so basically what that means is that if the stress, if the equivalent stress in the bike crank ever exceeds 35,000 PSI, then the bike crank will fail, okay? So right now we're good because our maximum stress here is only 13,000, okay? But what I want you to do is I want you to increase the amount of force on the bike crank until we reach that point, okay? But, you know, you never want to design a part, you know, up until, right up until failing. And so you always want to give a factor of safety. And so for this, uh, for this bike crank, I'm gonna, I want you to use a factor of safety of two. Okay. And so the way to kind of combine these is, is you know, we're going to take our maximum yield strength, which is, which is 35,000. Okay. And then we're going to divide it by the factor of safety. So the factor of safety here is two. Okay. And so if we divide it by two, we end up with 17,500 PSI. And so we basically, I, what I basically want you to do in problem five is I want you to increase the load. And so I want you to go to the force here and increase the magnitude up until you reach a maximum, stre a maximum stress of 17,000 PSI, okay? So let me show you. So right now with 100 pounds, 100 pounds will give us a, an equivalent stress of about 13,000, okay? And so if I increase this, so let me increase this to 150 pounds. And so if I rerun the simulation with the force set at 150 pounds, uh, hello, 
the simulation. Weird. <clears throat> okay. And so if I increase the force to 150, you can see here that the maximum stress now is about just about 20,000. Okay. And so in absolute sense, this would be this would be okay. And so the, the right crank won't fail, but it will violate our factor of C. Okay. So this is too high. Okay, and so for problem five, basically what I want you to do is I, I want you to change this force. And so you're, you're gonna have to do it a few times and so you're gonna have to change this force until you have a maximum equivalent stress of about 17,500. Okay, so that's problem five. So, you know, you can definitely, you know, work on that today. <clears throat> problem six, I want you to repeat problem five, but instead of applying the force in the Y direction, I want you to apply the force such that the, the bike crank is in compression, okay? And so you're gonna change instead of the Y direction, you're gonna change it to the X direction, okay? specifically the negative X direction. Okay? And so if you look at the direction of the force that puts the force you know, right, down, uh, right, down the, um, right down the long <laughs> axis of the, of the bike crank, okay? And what you should see is that this changes the nature of the stress. So you're no longer getting a, a, a bending stress, but what you're getting instead is a compressive stress, okay? And what you should see right here is that the stress should reduce pretty significantly, okay? And so when the force is in compression, I want you to do the same thing. So I want you to find the maximum load that you can apply until this bike crank is gonna fail in compression, okay? Right, um, and then um, after that, you're gonna summarize your findings, okay? And so, you know, starting, starting from this activity, you know, I'm gonna make this part of every activity where you basically take everything that you did in the activity and you kind of write a summary, okay? So the way that you kind of, kind of imagine this is that, you know, imagine that you're kind of an engineer that you work at a company and you're basically communicating the results of your finite elements to your manager, okay? And so you're writing them an email to kind of summarize your results. And so I kind of left some bullet points here for you to kind of um, make sure that you include in your summary, okay? So you, I want you to make sure you include your FEA decisions. And so I want you to include, you know, what size of the mesh that you chose, you know, what uh, shape of the elements, uh, what are the order of the elements, okay? I want you to look at the, the boundary conditions, where you apply the boundary conditions and why you think those are appropriate, okay? Um, I want you to talk about what's the maximum allowable load on the current design. So this is the result of problem five. And then based on those results, I want you to make a recommendation on whether the company should redesign this bike crank uh, to either be more robust, okay? All right. And so, you know, communication is, is, is important. So I want to make sure that, you know, you know, we're not only just, you know, performing the finite element simulations, but we're also working on how do we best communicate those results, okay? Um, and so you can almost think of this as practice for the projects because, you know, a big part of the projects are, you know, you're going to be running a lot of finite element simulations, but you're also gonna be summarizing them in the report. So this is kind of, you know, good practice part for that, okay? Um, and kind of always remember, you know, when you're, when you're writing communication about FEA, just remember that, you know, the people you're communicating with, and they may kind of have a, a vague idea of what FEA is, but they may not be fully versed with all of the details. And so you wanna make sure that you choose, you know, which details to include and how you communicate so that you get your point across. All right, and the last thing for this activity is uh, a bike frame analysis. And so, you know, we did a bike crank. So now I want you to re repeat this for a bike frame. And so, you know, this is the second CAD file that I've included. And so, um, and so for problem seven, the very last one, um, you're basically gonna repeat that, this analysis for the bike frame. There's kind of additional, um, additional instructions here. Okay, and so that's the that's the rest of the activity. And so you guys are free to kind of work on it for the rest of the class. I'll, I'll be making my rounds again if you have any questions. Um, but are there kind of any general questions I can answer about the activity? Yeah. Uh, for the homework, whenever you, spec you specify like if it's gonna, you know, if the crank is gonna fail, that's only that's based on the factor of safety. Correct. Right, but not absolutely. Correct. Yeah. So it's with the factor of safety. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I. I yeah, somehow I overlooked that. I, I, I actually I actually did read through the whole thing this year, which I didn't do last year, and I still missed this. So, <laughs> so you do have to do both. You have to, you have to do both problem six. And so you can call this problem six A and problem six B. 
Uh, but what I'll probably do is tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll update the assignment and I'll, I'll do I'll review the numbering so it's not confusing. Yeah. All right. Any kind of other general questions? Well, I have a question. If no one in the class has any questions, sure, Ivan, go ahead. Uh, so, <coughs> whomever asked that last question, because uh, I'm on Zoom, I didn't hear it clearly. Obviously. Uh, yeah, so there, there's two problems. Six. Yeah, so yeah. I, there's two problems. I, I messed up on the numbering. So what I'll do tomorrow is I'll I'll, I'll update the PDF um, uh -huh. so the numbering is correct, and then you know I'll upload the, the correct PDF. Thank you, sir. We greatly appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and is lecture over? Yes, and so that's that's all okay. that's all I have planned for today. And so what I'll do is I'll stick around. Um, if you have if you if you're kind of struggling with certain parts, if you have questions on the activity, um, I'll answer that. But yeah, that's that's all I have for today. So if you and want to then, work on the rest of it at another time. Uh, you're free to log off. Uh, it sounds good. I also have, uh, so next lecture, are we going to go over the second part or is it going to be, what's the format for next lecture? What's the plan for next lecture? <clears throat> so the next lecture is just going to be a pure kind of just taking notes lecture. So this oh, is, this see, is all see. that I'm going to talk about for activity, I see, I see. activity two. And so the rest huh. of it is going to be homework. Sounds good. All right, then, sir. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. Yeah, so if you want to work on it at home, you should uh, you should actually archive it. And so um, go to file right here and go to archive, and then it'll save everything as one zip, one zip file. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you're working on your own personal laptop, you can just use the regular save, regular save option. And for those of you in the class, so, so technically the rules are that if you guys are going to be in here, that I have to be in here too. Um, but if you want to work after the class is over, that's that's fine with me. Um, the only thing I ask is the last person in here just closes the door and, and turns off the lights. So. Oh, no, no, just, just, just the lines. Just, just. Oh, you're probably, I think for most people, it's probably just the number of I don't, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, you can, you can just have to do that. Um, but what you would probably want to see is that. Just, just the What is that? Mesh refinement? Yeah. It was a. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was refinement object right here. And so what? So this is actually. Oh, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. For this one, for this one, I, I wouldn't worry about it just because it's it's you know the the stresses are mostly concentrated in the middle. Um, refinement is more when you have stress concentration near your edges. Yep, I blew it again. We can. Yep. First five problems. Oh, yeah. First five problems. They're not this, right? They're our homework. The first five, we, I mean, we, we did them together in class, but there are still parts you need to document. So make sure you answer the question. The figures that I asked for. So for those, yeah, for those figures, you know what we wrote, right? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't have because that works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, um, when you're not in class, because Friday, we're coming up class on Saturday, obviously, we're class. I see. And so, like, before class, something, we have not in class. Before class, we come here and work on Saturday after. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, how do we get access to it? So, I mean, email. So, uh, how do you guys feel about an access point? So, there's that formal basis to say that, you know, you guys are students in my course, so you need access to work on it. And then, if, if the door is locked, what you can do is you can call the campus police. And then you can show them the form and then they can open it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Another way you can do it from, from home. Um, I'll put I'll put instructions for this online is that we have something called the virtual virtual machine. And so even on a Mac laptop, you can basically can log in virtually to the phone numbers here. And you can use ANSYS that way. It's kind of slow though, so people usually don't like using it. But in kind of in an emergency, that effect that, that could be that. So I'll, let me I'll remind me, I'll, I'll send instructions. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we'll send them in. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. So the not 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 that precise and so if you have like if it's between 17,000 18,000 that's that's good enough. Yeah. that's pretty good that's pretty that's pretty good <laughs> no 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 yeah that's that's pretty good Oh, yes, yeah, so they changed this quick. That was from the Google. Isn't it true that when we change the course, we change it back to, um, yeah. Oh, let's um, see. Which is, yeah. So if I go like the course, yeah, it's not the same now. But if you want to change it, it goes back to the actual course. No, I don't want to. Oh, that's true. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's a problem until they move. Yeah, one through five. Yeah, one through five. And then the very last, the only thing you use the second cat is for the secret. Yeah, throw the second eight. Yeah, thank you. I'll be over here. Yeah, I'll be over here. I actually read through the PDF of my post. I still like the post. Oh, great. No. I saw that. Oh, I read that. Yeah, a lot of over the fact that red tag size of the initial package. My ex worker did that. I'm in the space that I'm Fine. 
Right when you archive it, it's only like the, just that one application. Yeah. Everything's in that one application. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's in that one application. Yep. Have a good night. Yeah. So where it says like explain how you came to the number of Ah. I mean for the meshing, the meshing problem. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it doesn't. Um, so kind of talk a bit about, you know, like the relationship between like element size and accuracy. That's kind of what I'm looking like looking for there. We have, we, we're not doing, we're not doing an exact mesh convergence test, but you do still want to have like a good amount of elements to, to make sure that it's, it's accurate. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, the polymer. So like this, this one right here, right? Yeah. So for that one, you know, basically, if you kind of looked at the default mesh that we started with, it was very, very coarse. And so basically, we wanted a mesh that was more has more elements than that. And so we basically refined the mesh until it looked kind of visually visually good. <laughs> I think yeah, for me. Oh, yeah, for me. 